been smarter than humans. We will get to know now. Timo Mertens, head of ML and NLP products at Grammarly, Oz Petrov, CTO and co-founder at Reface, moderated by Will Knight, senior writer at Wired. Welcome, welcome. It's the final day of Emerge. Um, we've already had some amazing content for you. Uh, and of course, uh, I hope you've been taking advantage of all of the different things, the networking, the workshops, uh, meeting each other, greeting each other, the jobs board, etc., etc. Uh, I also hope you've been keeping an eye on those rockets on the main stage. Uh, we'll be asking you to uh, tell us how many you've counted across the three days later to see if you can win a wonderful prize from Shivas. Uh, but right now, we're going to get by to the content. Uh, Talking about algorithms that are smarter than humans and what's the future for both. Uh, you know, machines can check your spelling. They can advise you on your tone of voice in your email. Um, they can even create videos with creatures that don't exist or make you dance like Shakira. Uh, I'm not sure they can do that for me. Uh, that's maybe a little bit of a stretch. Uh, is this scary? Is it exciting? Well, let's find out. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our moderator. It's Will Knight, senior writer at Wired. He writes all about artificial intelligence. And he's going to introduce you to his panel. Will, over to you. Thanks, Stuart. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, and welcome to this panel. So we have two great speakers to uh, discuss this topic. Timo Mertens, head of machine learning and NLP at Grammarly. Hi, Timo. And Oles Petriv, who is CTO and co-founder of Reface. It's a very cool app that lets you do some face swapping. Um, so yeah, the, it's a it's a very interesting, provocative subject or uh, title, I should say, algorithms that are smarter than human and what is the future for, for both. Let's, let's interrogate that idea that, human, that algorithms are smarter than humans. Obviously, we've seen some amazing things happening in AI recently, really sort of stuff that makes you, makes it seem like algorithms really are smarter than humans. And um, so, so in what ways are they? I mean, one, one example would be GPT-3, this, this amazing algorithm that can conjure up stories, answer questions, do all sorts of things um, with language. And Timo, you seem like a great person to, to get into that. Um, we can talk more about sort of visual AI as well. But yeah, so how, would you, how, do you, how do you think we should think about AI and it's how intelligent it really is when it comes to language? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, certainly over the last few years, we've seen almost a golden age of specifically natural language processing, uh, which makes sense of, of human language, if you will, in various different shapes and forms. Um, and we've seen a massive breakthrough in these uh, big pre-trained language models. I can do all kinds of different operations on top of text. I think some of the really interesting examples are when they start to generate text. Um, and it's really impressive what they can do in all the different types of, of applications. But I wouldn't call this necessarily intelligence, certainly not human intelligence. And to me, what these models have become really strong at and good at is sort of looking at you know, a lot of data, in this case, the internet, really, and anything that was written on the web and synthesizing those pieces together in, in interesting ways. But to me, that's not quite good enough. To me, it's really about solving real underlying problems problems that humans have in, 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 uh, in this scenario when they communicate. That's what Grammarly thinks a lot about. And it's really about solving a problem that is extremely important to users and not just showcasing the technology around it. And uh, I, I think that is where oftentimes these types of technologies are, are somewhat misrepresented, that I think they are great showcases at what is possible in different ways. But in order to solve an actual problem, you have to start to identify the underlying problem. You have to see how, how humans are working around these problems. Today, you have to figure out how to get the right data for that problem and then use that technology and that data to build an actual user experience that is delightful that people would want to use every single day. And that's quite different from you know, the general premise of these models being able to do all kinds of things. Now, I would also say that a pretty big shortcoming of these big systems today is that they don't really put the user at the center. Um, you know, they are good at generating general language and interesting uh, sort of, and sometimes impressive bits and pieces 
of text, but they don't know who you are. They don't know what your specific writing style might be or what your priorities are. And I think that's a pretty massive frontier for us to really go beyond these one size fits all types of models and really make them work for humans. Mm. Well, um, so let me just push back a tiny bit because you know the the what the the premise here or the, the the title is you know what is the future for for both of both humans and algorithms mm -hmm. and obviously looking at GPT three or looking at the progress in language and we'll get onto visual effects and so on you can see how some people may be thinking wow do we need humans to you know, I don't know what it whether it's right like write reviews of of products based on what they've seen or um, summarize documents or you know, some companies are starting to sort of generate, auto-generate emails and so on. So, so how, you know, should we be concerned about that? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. I think about it as augmenting humans rather than replacing them and taking them out. And I think more and more we can give humans superpowers when they think about communication or when they think about, you know, writing emails or producing their own creativity, if you will. Um, and, and I think that is how Grammarly, for example, approaches that technology. It's always in the service of the end user to make their workflows just better, make their mm -hmm. output more impactful, but it's not taking them out and, and completely automating them away. And I think as soon as you start to think about it this way, the way that we build these technologies actually becomes quite different. And, and we think about more of, you know, what are the underlying problems that the user actually has? And then how do we string together these different types of technologies and models in a meaningful way to build an end product. Okay, well, we can get into a bit into um, this idea of collaboration, but Oles, let me let me bring you in, and um, you know how you, some of the stuff that's going on in, in like in computer graphics involving AI is really amazing. It's really astounding, and um, it's it's become sort of difficult to believe our our eyes when we see things. I mean. That's evident from your app, but how do you how do you think about the sort of um, what this says about the intelligence of machines, like the ability to conjure up um, faces, like these um, these faces that don't exist? Does that say something you think profound about the capabilities of machines? You know, uh, I think it says more about capability of human more <laughs> than capability of machines because uh, there, these algorithms are are pretty straightforward. So it's just list of matrices that multiplies uh, between the, themselves, and then you get some so, so, some matrices uh, as the input, some matrices as the output, and having a lot of uh, example samples, uh, these algorithms can generalize some patterns there, there are between this uh, input and, and output uh, examples. Uh, and pretty interesting that human perception can be easily um, hijacked by um, utilizing these hidden uh, dependencies between input and output images. So uh, using simple linear algebra, because you know all this neural network is just simple linear algebra with a little bit of uh, powerful GPU. So yeah. Nothing, yeah, no, no. nothing magical. Right. I know obviously it does, it taps into this kind of amazing ability we have to recognize and respond to faces, right? That's, that's yeah, a, that's but, a but human perception is, uh, um, have its own plasticity. So, um, you know, training a lot of different neural networks all day long for years and years, and your uh, perception system trained with, uh, all together with this neural network, and, and you can detect some um, artifacts of uh, synthesized videos um, mm -hmm. as a result of uh, enriching your data set of true and, true and false um, example. But I don't think the, the main issue is uh, Incapability of human perception uh, to recognize where which sample is synthesized and which sample is real, uh, but uh, context in which we use these technologies. Because you know, um, having knife uh, can enable you to kill people or uh, to to make a toast. Right, uh, <laughs> make toast. 
yeah. well, hopefully hopefully you're not killing anybody or um you're more effectively making toast yeah, so, but so it, i think right now we, we on the on the stage where um it is really important to commoditize uh socially responsible ways of utilization of such technologies mm -hmm. so uh to to make all people understand that knife is a tool for making your toys mm -hmm. for making the toast not for killing people right well that, i mean that's a good that's a good point because the, the it's a somewhat just a reflection of how powerful these technologies are right the ability to conjure up faces that look incredibly like someone else or um to to, to write text that looks very convincing so do you think that will i mean I, this is for both of you i guess but do you think that this will necessitate some um, regulation or just kind of thinking around just a change in attitudes towards what is and isn't real because i, I think we saw we've seen that with for example um you know photoshop and our perception of photographs in the past um i mean it, but it's a, it'd be a bit different in the world of of text timo it's just something that i don't think people have really had to kind of consider so far yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good question. And, you know, going back to my previous premise of, you know, I think of it as this, these technologies augmenting humans, right? I think it's very much these systems need to become more attuned to how you might communicate and how you maybe even think about your context and what your priorities might be. Um, but also to all this point, these systems still are fairly simplistic in nature. And as such, I think it's really about um, if you have the human at the center of this, of this technology loop, it's really about explaining to humans what these systems can or cannot do, and also how these systems work, and then ultimately giving you some degrees of controls. Mm. Uh, now, I would say even today, um, these general one-size-fits-all models aren't good enough to, you know, imitate you completely or to, you know, produce something where we'd say this is a creative piece um, of, of sort of information or in a very effective um, artifact at work, uh, but I think of it as these become extremely powerful tools to augment what you are doing, such that you maybe spend more time being creative rather than you know throwing this over to a model that then takes that on and on your behalf. Right, um, and it, it, you know, is that the, how how the person operates within this technology? One of the key questions. I mean, it would seem to me because because I know it's difficult to sometimes prompt these things to do what you want in the example of NLP. Um, but then there's also real, really interesting creative possibilities that are opened, I think, by use of um, you know, face swapping on these tools that can manipulate. It's suddenly democratizing kind of quite advanced CGI. So, I mean, you must both sort of think about that. Ole, so how do you think about, and you must see this a lot from people using the, the app, right? Um, yeah, I think commoditization of technology is a, one of the, Mm, responsible commoditization of uh, generative technology is one of the, the best methods how to minimize misuse of, of such technology. So, uh, you know, if, if in a whole world only 10 people can somehow create ultra-realistic uh, deepfakes, it's a, it's a web weapon. Mm -hmm. But if in the, in the world billions of people can synthesize something using neural network uh, spending uh, 10 seconds and uh, provider of uh, such generative technology for synthesizing text, visual, uh, uh, visual information or some, so something mm -hmm. else, uh, provide technology in a responsible manner where uh, anyone can detect who created this particular uh, piece of content, where, how, uh, and so on. So uh, the the more easier way to create uh, some synthesized piece of content using uh, generative models, uh, right. and the more responsible way of providing such technolo technology, uh, less uh, mi less misuses we will see uh, using this such text. So uh, I don't believe in uh, some political regulations and so uh, for technology because fighting fi fighting against technology is a 
is a very and very um, in perspective method of it's often do, yeah the genie is out of the bottle right it's difficult yeah. to difficult to wrestle that that back um, although there is there is a fair bit of talk about you know regulating some of these some of these technologies you know, it, um, I w actually we, we could talk a little bit about this sort of ethical side of it like how you how you think about that are there things that you sort of think about here are guardrails we, we we're not going to do where we are going to do or, or you know questions around how to make sure algorithms aren't biased or don't reflect but human biases i should say um i mean that must come up in in language quite a fair bit timo when when you, you have something like grammarly you know potentially it could it could be skewed towards certain certain perspectives right yeah yeah um so connecting this also to the previous conversation mm -hmm. uh, we have taken uh sort of deliberate or made deliberate choice in the product such that we present um our progress you know providing suggestions rather than you know declaring what is right or wrong or, or sort of almost dictating mm -hmm. you know here's that one way that you should do it it's ultimately um the user's choice right and and we're fairly transparent while we're making these suggestions and how they work um and and likewise i think we've uh, invested quite a lot throughout the development process starting from how we um you know look at data how we think about the types of models that we build and then ultimately how we learn from our users to mitigate dimensions of of biases that exist in these products but i also believe that you know ultimately we are looking at these paradigm shifts here like communication yeah. will change the way that people write will change and i think technology will supercharge us in so many different ways but as long as we stick to these principles of you know the human is at the center and the, the technology is built around the human to uh, give them those superpowers to augment them and they have controls they understand how it works and what's actually going on as much mm -hmm. as we can i think these paradigms will actually come come uh, together quite nicely rather than it becoming sort of right. this this fear of humans you know being thrown out of that loop and and machines taking over if you will i think that's a very good point i mean um one of the things that, that seems very interesting about what both of you are doing with your companies is is um that, you know, uh, Oles, you, you, you know, you make the point that this is really just linear algebra underlying some these neural networks, which is absolutely true. But um, we are starting to see glimpses of a of, um, completely different paradigm in, in communicating with machines and through machines, right, in terms of being able, then being able to kind of use language, then being able to use, you know, our, one of our most powerful forms of communication, which is how we express our, our you know, facial expressions and Body language and so on, and 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 who we are, who, who we're presented to be, and I, I, I think I, I really agree with Timo that this is, you know, we're looking, we're starting to see what could be a really, really big shift. I, I, I mean, Olis, how do you think about um, how how that where that might go? I mean, this may be sort of commercial opportunities as well in terms of just thinking about, like I, I, I imagine the idea we were talking about, like um, doing uh, deep fakes to sync your lips but like real-time translation over zoom for example where you appear to be speaking mandarin or yeah or german or something whatever uh, in the in the digital space we used to use plain text uh to communicate with each other but uh, even the language is pretty pretty efficient method of communication uh, we in a, in a text language uh, in the digit, in the digital space we lost one of the uh, really really important part of uh, natural communication is uh, mm. um, emotion second emotional uh, communication channel uh, using um, facial expression and, and so on yeah uh, and this second communication channel um, Minimize possible misunderstanding in a natural communication, and in the digital communication, we usually see some artifacts uh, of total misunderstanding between people that communicate on the same language, but about totally different stuff, uh, without this uh, sync of emotional context. That's why you need emojis, right? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And we see this uh, evolution of, you know, these uh, smiles uh, using uh, brackets uh, in a text, then uh, emojis, bitmojis, and emojis, and 
every company uh, trying to create something that will um, that will do this work for uh, emotion emotion transfer uh, in the digital um, area, but we think that uh, emotion is one of the main source for creativity, and mm. creativity uh, can be used used as a um, trigger for. Um, enriching this emotional second background in the textual uh, communication between people. So mm -hmm. we think that creativity in the digital space uh, augmented with uh, neural networks, textual generative uh, networks, visual generative networks, and so on, uh, will transform our communication in digital space, uh, mm -hmm. not in a, um, will enrich it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine, you know, you, like uh, personal assistants, maybe, you know, have some sort of physical embodiment where you, if you have a, an emotional element to that, it's a, it's a completely different, it's, it's sort of game changing. And it, it, you could see how that can be very, very yeah, effective. But, but in, a, in a natural space, we have our face as mm -hmm. an uh, instrument for, uh, for our emotional expression. Yeah. In the digital space, we can using different uh, CGI techniques, and if we commoditize them uh, enough, uh, we can use not only our face. We can use any any part of visual, audio, or right. uh, textual right. content to express our emotional background to minimize possible misunderstanding uh, uh, during our uh, our communication. Yeah. So, I, I would, add, yeah, go ahead, Timo. Yeah, sorry. I would add, add on top of that, and I, I, I agree. I think there's certainly the multimodality of it all, of how we communicate, how we express ourselves. That is, I think, uh, a really fascinating frontier. Um, you know, even just for text, you know, as, as we think about it at Grammarly, we've gone beyond just syntax, right? Of like, is your writing correct? And did you make spelling mistakes? And much more towards meaning, right? Like, did you express yourself in writing with the right kind of tone that you wanted mm. to strike mm. you know are you clear enough are you concise enough right and and maybe even if you're not a native speaker did you sound like a native speaker would right and i think those are massive opportunities when you think and all of a sudden right when you think about this degrees these degrees of miscommunication especially in the enterprise space right where groups and teams are working together all over the globe where a lot of it is based on textual communication be it emails or you know messages documents yeah. right if if you don't get that all quite right there's there are so many degrees of miscommunication um that i i would argue millions of dollars are lost every single mm. year because of it that's interesting so that's something you're starting to sort of um to look into that so the uh, final question i think because we're running out of time but there the, must there must be a kind of um well i'm curious if you have a feeling that you are you're sort of dealing with something quite powerful because i mean I, like i i think of um you know like these Alexa, Siri, personal assistant, the ability of a person to be persuasive, right? Like a salesperson, the language they use, the facial, the body language they use um, is enormously important. And it's, I mean, in many ways, the, the technology we have currently is very crude in terms of like interacting with people. So do you think, I mean, do you, you don't have to answer like what the, the dangers are, but do you, do you think that there are these kind of big opportunities that sort of at society we're going to have to think about and you'll both have to be a little bit brief i'm afraid yeah i mean i i think it really goes back to sort of the philosophy of if you put the user at the center you structure the technologies around them and mm -hmm. you're transparent as much as you can how these systems work and it's never just one system right it's a grouping of systems and it's a sequence of systems that come together as long as you make that clear and ultimately give the users choices Right. Mm -hmm. I think um, these paradigm shifts, as we've described them, will come together um, in a very user centric way. I think what will cause concern is if users ultimately feel like they don't have control anymore, that these okay. systems are doing things that they don't understand anymore. Great, great. And, and Oles, um, from your perspective, you know, do you sort of you feel like there's going to have to has to be some sort of ethical approach to this? Um... First of all, we we should remember that 
any technology we are creating, we're creating for, for human. Right. Um, second, we should understand then um, the way human use technology can modify what human is and what 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 mm. human uh, mm, for what things human utilize this technology and uh, what why we we think that uh, it is important to uh, com responsible companies to commoditize such technology that sometimes uh, can mm, trigger some fears in a in a in a media or, or so and so on because if technology already exists it will be somehow commoditized yeah uh, yeah if it is not commoditized yet it is a chance to to do it well right well like, i think and you guys coming on here and and uh talking openly about this and showing that you're thinking about it is uh, a good a good step in that direction so um, I'm going to wrap up now. Let me just say thank you very much to Timo and Oles. That was really fun. I, I enjoyed that a lot. And I will hand back now to Stuart. Excellent. Thank you so much, Will. And uh, thank you to Oles and Timo. Um, that was a fascinating chat. Uh, so, audience, uh, we're getting close to the end, but we still have some amazing content for you. Um, you'll need to leave this session and stay on the main stage uh, and open up the next session, um, which is the American Dream, how tech products born in the new east gain success on the u.s market uh, of course you know by now uh, to keep your eyes open for those shivas rockets flying across the screen and also all of the other features of pine your emerge home uh, for the last three days uh, again thank you to our wonderful wonderful moderator and panelists for this session and we'll see you at the next one <laughs>